Murli. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, Vinod Kumar, sir, uh, I'm just humbled that I'm in this session with you, uh, stalwarts uh, like yourself and uh, Dr. Buraskar, sir, who are chairing. And I'm very, very honored by this uh, opportunity that I've been given by Dr. Rajiv Chawla, sir, as well as Dr. Shalini. And uh, he's been my mentor and teacher, so it's always uh, I'm always nervous speaking in front of him. But anyway, so I go straight to the topic, obesity management as the primary treatment goal for diabetes. A lot of things that I'm going to say are obvious, but I've just put them all together uh, to drive home the point that we need to start thinking of tackling with obesity uh, as a primary goal for diabetes rather than anything else, because uh, it's almost like ek teer se kai nishani, uh, ek saath maar sakte hai hai. So, you know, it's that one driver which takes care of so many different aspects. Um, yes, the global challenge of obesity, we know uh, more than 30-40% of the world's ob uh, population is overweight or obese. And in <clears throat> India too, this is increasing multifold. It's obvious and we as physicians are dealing with this every single day. In fact, even with the dual a problem of uh, malnutrition, whether it's undernutrition or overnutrition, the greatest rise and highest numbers of obesity are now seen in low and middle income countries and India is top in the top five out there. In fact, much higher for uh, the prevalence in women which is also very, very disturbing. Again, the prevalence of obesity in diabetes, and I'm driving home that point because more than 85% of our people living with diabetes are overweight and obese. And in fact, eight to 10% are even morbidly obese. And I'm sure we are underestimating the numbers here. It's much higher than that. And the bad part is that the projections over the next few years is as bad. We are going to have more and more people with diabetes associated with obesity. And unfortunately, with every unit increase in BMI, the probability of developing diabetes increases 1.5% in those who are already overweight or obese. Again, the number of deaths related with diabetes, uh, which are attributable to high BMI, are also very high in the Southeast Asian region, which includes India. Coming to this very nice term or phrase, diabetes, it, it is just used to describe the combined detrimental effect of this dual epidemic that we have, obesity and diabetes. Because again, just a, like I just told you, more than 85% of those with diabetes are overweight or obese. And this number of diabetes associated with obesity is only increasing and is going to be in the million, in further millions by in the next few years. In every study that has been done to understand the risk factors associated with diabetes, increased adiposity is the strongest one. So this double burden of obesity or adiposopathy and diabetes is synergistic and syndemic in a negative way because they both promote the two core defects, which is insulin resistance and beta cell decompensation. For example, adiposopathy uh, may lead to sleep disorders and inability to be you know, very active and also the uh, you know, social stigma, the impaired mental health, and all this we know feeds into diabetes. Diabetes, on the other hand, feeds further into obesity or adiposopathy. Uh, and using them interchangeably because that's how it is. The storm is coming up uh, very fast because obesity somehow was probably not uh, associated or you know very well uh, acknowledged as a pathophysiological condition. But adiposopathy clearly tells you that it's a pathological condition where it's all related to the adipose tissue. So in the background of an uh, adverse physical environment and also increasingly acknowledged social factors like disadvantage or, viol or violence or in income inequality, we know that these two, two uh, epidemics are literally thriving uh, in, and feeding into each other. Obesity is also uh, associated 
with increased morbidity and mortality, not just due to diabetes, but also hypertension, dyslipidemia, and cardiovascular disease. And this obesity, especially in the Indian population, is more linked with the abdominal obesity, which is the extra adipose tissue around the intra-abdominal organs, or which is referred to as the visceral or central obesity. And this is what leads to the severe and the distinct pathological conditions. Again, the manifestations are myriad, as you can see. Almost, what, what? almost everything is affected by, uh, 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 affected adversely by obesity, as you can see. And even the development of cancer in so many different organs is associated or uh, uh, known to arise from uh, the fact uh, that uh, somebody is obese. Well, the underlying, the origin, the risk factors, and the pathophysiological mechanisms of both are common. It's common milieu. And increased adiposity is associated with increased adipokine synthesis, which leads to increased inflammation. There's increased lipid production. Again, that leads to lipotoxicity and dyslipidemia. And then increase in the activity of the, paras uh, the sympathetic nervous system, as well as the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And the mechanical stress of uh, increased weight itself, all those together, they lead to the manifestation of so many different complications. And this is just to stress upon the fact that, uh, you know, right from stage one, which is at risk of the population, which then goes on to develop pre-diabetes, uh, ABC is nothing but adipose-based uh, cardiometabolic disease. And that goes on to, you know, further, uh, that feeds, uh, uh, you know, the obesity increases, and then that is uh, related to actually disease manifestation, and then cardiometabolic as well as the biomechanical complications, which is stage four. All this feeds into the diabetes-based cardiometabolic disease, as we know, so it's very closely or intricately involved, uh, and it's all based with insulin resistance, which leads to pre-diabetes and then diabetes. And then we have the macro and microvascular complications that manifest. So you see it's all uh, so intricately and closely feeding into each other. Just different ways of showing the same thing. Again, as uh, if you look at the top uh, panel, uh, very clearly it shows that increase in adiposopathy is associated with increasing insulin resistance and hyperglycemia in tandem and reduction of beta cell function, as you can imagine. It's proven. Uh, the other thing to note here is that uh, look at the continuum of obesity, and you can see that obesity is like sort of the origin of everything because metabolic syndrome, pre-diabetes, diabetes, all manifest at some point in the continuum, but it's obesity that, that's actually uh, there in the background throughout. So well, at various stages of obesity, you want that you can intervene and prevent the comorbidities or prevent the next stage. Uh, say, for example, if you just, when somebody is starting to gain weight and you can you know, prevent the comorbidities or prevent further weight gain, you can halt the entire process of developing metabolic syndrome or pre-diabetes or diabetes, and then the related micro and macrovascular complications. This is just to you know, further impress upon that fact. Very specifically, the effect of rise in BMI on the likelihood of being diabetic has also been seen. And uh, compared to non-overweight individuals, the likelihood of being diabetic is more than twice in overweight and obese individuals. With every unit increase in BMI, the probability of developing diabetes is more than 1.5% among overweight and obese individuals and 0.5% in non-overweight individuals. Again, the same thing that developing more than 90% of our people with diabetes have overweight or obesity. And uh, this is only increasing uh, with increasing BMI. Weight loss now uh, that uh, gives us a holistic approach to diabetes treatment. When, if you use the glucocentric approach, then it's, you're tackling probably the microvascular as well as the macrovascular complications. But if you start upstream or you start at the weight itself, then you're tackling so many other aspects of, uh, of being obese 
uh, and the comorbidities like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, as well as the cardiovascular manifestations also, and type 2 diabetes and hyperglycemia as well. The benefits of uh, weight loss have been studied in several well-designed studies. And for example, the Darking study, Finnish DP DPS study, all have shown that in intensive lifestyle change aimed at uh, weight loss has always been associated with reduction, with significant reduction in the progression of pre-diabetes to diabetes, almost to the tune of 51 to uh, 48 percent. In the DPP also, it was shown that intensive lifestyle was far better than metformin, but metformin also helped in weight loss and helped to contain the progression to diabetes. In fact, the look ahead trial was one which, uh, where, uh, the look ahead was one where the weight loss benefits were seen uh, to, you know, they were uh, uh, evaluated to have any effect on the, the CV outcomes, even though they did not it was very, very heartening to see the reduction in weight, the reduction in HbA1c, the reduction in uh, triglycerides as well, uh, the cholesterol as well as uh, the blood pressure. And that was uh, a lot of increase in healthy lifestyle behavior as well in the participants. So again, a lot of benefits of weight loss. Direct trial, again, has, uh, has been a landmark trial in diabetes remission. We all know that. And that was aimed at a 15 kilo weight loss in those participants using the whole meal replacement uh, pattern. And uh, we, we saw that diabetes remission was uh, very well achieved in those participants as well. Lots of studies. Again, I just want to highlight that more the weight loss, higher the diabetes remission. We also know that weight loss with lifestyle intervention is also is uh, you know impacts the interplay of the hormones that impact the energy in and energy out. Metabolic surgery or bariatric surgery, which call, which is indicated for those with diabetes with a BMI of more than forty or more than thirty five who do not uh, achieve uh, durable weight loss and improvement in comorbidities with non surgical methods. Again, these are the ones who really benefit as there is substantial uh, re uh, remission of diabetes and other comorbidities associated with uh, weight gain. Uh, again, bariatric patients may require additional lifelong medical follow-up and management after surgery, but well, if they were that with diabetes, that is what would be required anyway. Uh, so again, we have lots of studies that have Proving the effect of bariatric, uh, bariatric surgery in the remission of diabetes, if there is weight regain, yes, there may be some amount of diabetes that develops even post-bariatric surgery. But overall, the micro and macrovascular complications, there is a significant reduction in those with bariatric surgery and the improvement in quality of life is unparalleled. Weight independent anti diabetes uh, mechanisms of metabolic surgery are equally acknowledged now with a myriad of benefits in the gut microbiota or the nutrient sensing or the hormones or increase in the glucose metabolism, so on and so forth. But weight loss is very difficult to achieve in those with diabetes because of not only sedentary or lifestyle uh, behavior pattern, but also the fear of hypoglycemia that drives some of them to overeat, the burden of diabetes itself, the medications, or even the reduction in glucosuria. Weight loss impacts glycemic control. The methods may be different, but sustained weight loss is the key for those with diabetes, and the amount of weight loss also determines the magnitude of glycemic control. Again, benefits of weight loss, as I already showed you, are much beyond glycemic control. Just to emphasize, look at this, uh, look at this diagram, and you can see that those requiring a weight-centric uh, approach to diabetes is far more than those requiring a cardiocentric approach or a glucocentric approach uh, for managing diabetes. Balance is the key. There are some drawbacks, but we need to acknowledge them and then address them as we, uh, as we uh, move on. And one important point that I would like to make here is that how much weight loss is really needed? Well, even 5% weight loss is beneficial as we've been telling all our patients for years together. 
but that sweet spot or something or, or a, the magnitude of weight loss required to achieve all or most of these benefits with associated with weight loss is somewhere around 15%. As you can see on the scale beautifully uh, outlined by Lingwe et al. Uh, she even presented an oration at the ADA this year, and it was, I think, a very, very moving oration uh, for those dedicated to the research of obesity. Well, so far, our, there were gaps in our obesity treatment, and we all have known that lifestyle modific modifications, as sustainable as they may be, they help us to achieve you know, minimal weight loss. And then when you add drug therapy, well, yes, up to 10% is also possible. And then the surgical procedures were the only ones available so far that would help us to achieve that 20 to 30% weight loss. But we are in an extremely exciting era where we have new in combination pharmacotherapy that's available now uh, and it's developing, it's in the pipeline that's going to help us and that's already been proven to help us achieve up to 20% weight loss, which was something in the past that was seen only with uh, surgical procedures. So this is something that's uh, very, very exciting. And I think this is also one of the reasons why we physicians are actually talking about weight loss as a primary goal to manage diabetes, as opposed to the conventional drugs that we had, which were uh, uh, actually making the patient increase weight. We have the newer med medications that are act, uh, either weight uh, neutral or definitely associated with weight loss. Especially, I'd like to highlight this SGLT2 inhibitors, the GLB1 receptor agonists, the amylin uh, analogs, and also the GIP and the GLP1 receptor agonists, unfortunately, which is not available in India, but will come soon. And even a good old metformin. Well, amongst the uh, anti-obesity drugs ruling the world right now, terzipotide is really exciting. It's self approved for diabetes, but it's been one of the first molecules to actually show up to 20% uh, weight loss in the trials uh, and in the clinic. And uh, that has been compared to sleeve gastrectomy results. Uh, so very, very exciting. Yes, adverse events are there. But I think uh, somebody who's dealing with obesity and diabetes probably can learn to deal with the adverse events as well with the help of uh, a you know, physician guiding all through. Again, the role of anti-obesity medications and its role in diabetes prevention is being studied. You can see that there are significant reduction in the incidence of developing diabetes itself Especially that has been seen with only stat, liraglutide, fentermine, and topalmate uh, combinations as well. And many other trials are underway. Their effects on HbA1c are in tandem with the weight loss that you see at year one. Um, and, you know, more than 50% are achieving uh, more than 5% weight loss as well. On the horizon, this is very exciting. Multi agonists are in development. The GLIP GIP dual agonist, the GLIP glucagon dual agonist, the GLIP GIP gluc glucagon triple agonist. And many of you may be investigators from India on the semaglutide 2.4 milligrams and the cragulin uh, tide 2.4 milligrams as well, because that's showing very promising results after tosipatide. And uh, yes, so these are the things that we welcome on the medical aspect of dealing with obesity. So again, if you have to look at the phenotype of the disease and uh, sort of categorize that, then you can see that the adipose-related diabetes as opposed to that with cardiovascular disease or just isolated hyper hyperglycemia, uh, this is a different approach to looking at diabetes. Uh, is again, we can see that 40 to 70% of our patients would benefit from a weight-centric uh, approach of managing diabetes. And in fact, those with cardiovascular disease, you know, is also, they are also going to benefit largely from uh, the, uh, the weight-centric approach as well. So again, the consensus for glucose-lowering medications in type 2 diabetes, we've always looked at the comorbidities and looked at drug, uh, you know, prioritizing drug therapy that uh, offers cardiorenal protection and cardiorenal uh, benefits. 
But yes, these are the same drugs that are also to be preferentially used when it comes to causing weight loss or even preventing further weight gain. So you can see all the factors, patient as well as disease factors here, that determine optimal glycemic targets and the characteristics um, you know, towards the left, these are all where we require more stringent control of A1C and towards the right are those that probably can do with a less stringent A1C target. But weight loss is, you know, once you achieve weight loss, then all these targets can be optimized and everything can just align with, uh, with weight loss itself. You may not have to even consider these other factors. So in summary, weight loss is the primary target for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Well, it treats the disease pathophysiology uh, at, at its core. There is reversal, remission, and of course, glycemic improvement that has already been proven. It minimizes the progression and the manifestation of diabetes-related complications. The benefits are far beyond diabetes or glycemic control alone. And the weight loss goal definitely needs to be individualized. However, it's the 15% sweet spot uh, of weight loss that leads to remission of adiposopathy associated conditions in the majority of patients. And patient selection will be based on phenotypes. So we'll start looking at patients in a slightly different manner, not the absolute BMI, of course. But most patients with diabetes will benefit from weight loss. Of course, it should be applied concurrently with all other applicable disease targets. You're not going to ignore other complications and effective treatment options exist already and are on the horizon and will be coming soon to India. With that, I thank you very much once again, Dr. Chavla sir, Dr. Shalini, Dr. Hassani, who also has been my teacher and the team for this opportunity and you all for the patient hearing.